Okay, we're continuing our corrections and we're starting today with question seven. Um, so you may or may not have gotten this corrected today in class, depending on which group you're in. An electric appliance store sells three different brands of televisions, all in various screen sizes and features as shown. Calculate how many different televisions can be produced from this store. So basically you can go in and how many different TVs could you potentially order? Whenever you see the word how many, I always want you to think of one thing, which is the fundamental principle of counting. And it means rather than having to list them all out, rather than to have to do a tree diagram or a two or three way table, I can figure out how many options there are by using the fundamental principle of counting, which means that I basically just have to think of how many choices do I have for the first, for the second, for the third. Okay, I'm using the word and here, which means therefore I'm multiplying. So within the first option, I have three choices. Within the second, I have two choices. And within the third, I have six choices. So altogether, there are 36 different TVs I can order. Now, you can do it also by going, I could get a Zoni Smart 24, a Zoni Smart 32, a Zoni Smart 40, a Zoni Smart 49. You can do it like that, listing it out. But in this space, they've given you quite a little amount of room, which basically means they want you to use the fundamental principle of counting. Number two, a customer purchased a television from a store. Assuming all brands and types of television are equally likely to be purchased, find the probability that that person purchased a Zoni 32 inch smart TV. So they went and they picked this and this and this, which means they had one choice out of 36. And remember, whenever you see the word find the probability, your answer needs to be a decimal or a fraction. Third part of that question says, a customer is chosen at random from those who bought the Philips. So suddenly, we have no Zonies, we have no Hamsons, we just have the Philips people. What is the chances that they chose a smart TV? So again, they're not interested in any of the inches of the TVs. What's the chances that if they bought a Philips, it was smart? And so they only have two choices there. So there is the probability of getting one out of two. Half. The third part of this question, uh, you may be thinking that we're so far we're on we're using probability and we're using multiplication, but this question asks us something different. Television screens are measured according to their diagonals. So when you buy a TV screen, it's this that's measured that tells you what inch it is. This television has a length of 32 inches and a width of 24 inches. But what is the diagonal? So what you have to do there is you have to spot that this section here is an actual fact, a right angle triangle. And in the right angle triangle, we're told two pieces of information. We're told that the first bit here, that the length is 24, or the width is 24, and the length is 32. They ask us to find the diagonal. So to find this here, it is of course a right angle triangle. And if I know two sides and I'm trying to find the third side of a right angle triangle, I can use Pythagoras' theorem, which is a squared equals b squared plus c squared, where a always stands for the longest side. And the longest side is always going to be this one here, which is opposite the right angle. So if I had a different triangle, and this is my right angle, this would be my longest side, which in that case is A. So here I'm going to call it A, or I can call it X, it's the thing I don't know. So I will have X squared equals 24 squared plus 32 squared, and you finish off accordingly. You want X on one side, everything else on the other, and how do you get rid of a square? You square root both sides. Okay, the third part of this question, or part B of question seven, is all about the Scrabble board. And if you've ever played Scrabble, you know that all the letters come in a bag and you could pick them out and you try and make names. So this is the letters, they're covered in the bag and it says that within each you have 42 vowels and 56 consonants. So if you were to select a vowel, the chances of it being picked are 42 out of 98. If you were to select a constant, 
Well, the chance of it being picked is whatever's left. And obviously there are 56 constants and 98. So the very first one you pick, it'll either be a vowel or a constant. Which is the greater probability? The constant, okay? So you're more like than likely to get a constant than a vowel. Okay, this is a tree diagram. Tree diagrams are all about events. The more branches, it shows the more events. So here we can say this is the first time that you might have picked out a letter. Here we have more branches, which means that this would be the second time you would have picked out letters. So, if you were to pick out a vowel on the first one, what would the chances be that you got a vowel again on the second? So, you've already picked out a vowel, which means that there's only now 41 vowels left. And also, you picked out a letter out of the bag, so there's now only 97 letters in the bag. So your chances of getting a vowel and a vowel would be 42 over 98 and 41 out of 97. This one here obviously means that if you got a vowel on the first one and then you did not get a vowel on the second. So this would be if you got a vowel on the first and a constant on the second. So a constant on the second. So if you got a vowel on the first it means that there's still 56 constants in the bag but now you only have 97 Scrabble letters. And this follows through for the remainder as well. If you got a constant on the first one, the chance of getting a constant on the second one, so getting a constant constant, would be 55 out of 97. And if you got a constant on the first one, what's the chance of getting a vowel? It would be no vowels have been picked yet, so you'd have 42, but you would be missing one letter, so it would be 42 out of 97. And that's the chances of getting a constant and then a vowel. So here I've filled in all of the options. The next part here asks for the probability that tiles selected are either both constants or both vowels. So in that case, you could get a constant and a constant, or you could get a vowel and a vowel. The words and and or in probability require a certain type of operation. If you are ever using the word and in probability, you are multiplying. If you are ever using the word or in probability, you are adding. So here, the question said both constants or both vowels. So in order for me to get a constant and a constant, on the first chance, the chance of me getting a constant on the first one, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring the image in here. So the chances of getting a constant on the first time I take a letter out is 56 out of 98. The chance of getting a constant again on the second time would be 55 out of 97. I'm using the word and there, which means I need to multiply those two answers. Or, well, we know that or means I add, the chances of getting a vowel and a vowel. So a vowel and a vowel, a vowel on the first one would be 42 out of 98. And I could get a vowel on the second. So a vowel on the second would be 41 out of 97. Okay, you're going to use your calculators there to find the final answer for that. Find the probability that at least one of the tiles selected is a vowel. So at least a vowel means I could have a constant and a vowel, or I could have a vowel and a constant, or I could have a vowel and a vowel. So what is the chance of getting a constant first and then a vowel? So a constant first and then a vowel would be 56 out of 98 multiplied by 42 out of 97. Or, so use the word plus, a vowel and a constant would be, uh, the chance of getting a vowel on the first one is 42 out of 98, and then a constant would be 56 out of 96. So 42 out of 98 multiplied by 56 out of 97. Or, so use the plus button, I could get a vowel and a vowel. So the chances of getting a vowel and a vowel is 41 out of 98 multiplied by 40, sorry, that was 42 out of 98 multiplied by 41 out of 97. 
Okay, again, you work all of that out individually, add your three answers together, and that's the probability that one of the tiles selected is a vowel. Question number 10. The diagram below is a scale drawing of a do dome which is the shape of a hemisphere. So hemisphere here, guys, a lot of the time further on, people spoke about spheres and you know the formulas for spheres, but it was never a sphere, okay? It was a hemisphere. The figure of a man who is 1.8 meters tall standing beside the dome allows the scale drawing to be estimate. Estimate the radius of the dome. Well, first of all, the radius is half of the dome here. So I'm going to figure out how many boxes long the dome is to find my diameter. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. So I know that 11 boxes in, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. So from here, this is my radius. Okay, but what is that? It's 11 boxes, but what does that represent? Am I told any other information? I'm told that the guy here is 1.8 meters tall. Therefore, every two boxes equals 1.8. Every one box would equal half that, which would be 0 0.9. Now, so we have 11 boxes, and we're multiplying that by 0 0.9 to get our answer. Using your answer to part A, find the curved surface area of the dome. Give your answer in meters squared correct to one decimal place. Okay, the curved surface area of a sphere is 4 pi r squared, and that's in your formula book. But we are dealing with a hemisphere, which means it's half that, which means that our formula is 2 pi r squared. From the earlier question, you should have gotten your radius to be equal to 9.9. .9. Therefore, it's 2 pi r squared. We now know that they told us to correct one decimal place, which means pi would be 3.14, or we could type our pi button into our calculator, all by 9.9 .9, all to be squared, and you should get 615.8 meters squared. So, well capable of doing that. The volume of the dome, and I actually said they should take, we should take pi to be 3.14, but they never told us, so we do press the pi button here. The volume of the dome is 2063.4 centimetres, sorry, metres cubed. Find the radius of the dome. Okay, so the volume of the dome. Volume of a sphere is 4 over 3 pi or cubed. You are not asked for a sphere, you are asked for a hemisphere. So it's 4 over 3 divided by 2, which if you did that onto your calculator, you would get 2 thirds pi or cubed. So we now follow on and solve all together. We know 2 thirds pi or cubed equals 2063.14. And we're now going to solve for or. We have an idea that or is 9.9. .9. Let's find out exactly what it is. So that will be, um, another way I can write this is 2 pi or cubed all over 3 equals 2063.14. What am I trying to get? Or. So I want or on one side, everything else on the other. So I'm now going to multiply by 3 on both sides. That will get rid of the divide by 3. And I'm left with 2 pi or cubed equals. I want you to finish this off for me now. And remember, how do you get rid of a cube? You're going to cube root both sides. The next question says, find the percentage change between the actual radius and the estimated radius. Well, when we did with the man, we figured out that it roughly is about 9.9. .9. In the last question, you had to find the radius when you knew the volume, and you should have got 9.95. So what is the difference, the percentage difference between these? Another word for percentage difference is percentage clearly decrease. How do you find it? It's the decrease all over the original, sorry, all over the original multiplied by 100. And that has come up time and time again on this paper. So the decrease is, it goes from 9.9 .9 to 9.95. It means the decrease is 0 0.05. The original, so what we originally thought, 
um, or the actual original is 9.95 multiplied by 100 and you will find the percentage decrease in that way. The last one says find the area of the floor of the dome. So if this is my hemisphere, okay, and inside it they want you to find the floor. The floor here, guys, is in the shape of a circle. So you're actually finding the area of a circle, which is pi or squared. It says in terms of pi, which means you leave pi into your answer. We now know that or, we've figured it out, is 9.95. So it's going to be pi times 9.95, and you can leave it as 99.0025 pi meters squared. What did a lot of people do here? They did the circumference. The area of the floor, how many people could you fit onto it? You're not going to just try and fit them around the side. It's inside and it's a circle. Imagine the hemisphere, imagine the, the um, hemisphere I have on my desk, which is the um, globe cut in half. It's a circle. The bottom of it is a circle, okay? Okay, so the equation of the line L is equal to 3x minus y minus 1, find the coordinates. So the first one is where L cuts the x-axis and then where L cuts the y-axis. Well, the y-axis is quite easy because we know if we write it in the form of y equals mx plus c, this number here is always where it cuts the y-axis. So if I was to do that, I would have... Uh, 3x minus y minus 1 equals 0. I'd have minus y equals 1 minus 3x. And then I'd have y equals uh, minus 1 and um, plus 3x. So my slope is 3, but it hits the y-axis at minus 1. So the point is 0 minus 1. Okay, to find the x-axis, you need to remember this. To find the x-axis, you let y be 0. So if that's the case, it's 3x minus y equal, sorry, minus 1 equals 0. y is now going to be 0, which means it doesn't exist. So I now have 3x minus 1 equals 0. 3x equals 1. x equals 1 third. And if your x is 1 third, we said y was 0. Okay, so they are where they cut the both axes. To find out where it cuts the y-axis, you can let x equal 0. That will also work. So to find out where it cuts the x-axis, you let y equal 0. Find the length of the segment between the two points found. Okay, so length of the line segment between two points. Length of the line, another word for length is distance. And we have a formula for that. So you're opening up the log tables and you're saying, right, y2 minus y1 all to be squared plus x2 minus x1 all to be squared. You now have your x1, y1, your x2, y2. You're now going to apply that formula. So the slope of line L. Well, if you think about it, when we wrote it in the form y equals mx plus c, we actually figured out the slope. So we actually did that earlier on. Now, if you hadn't done that and you had just cut the x-axis and y-axis by letting x and y equal 0, uh, you would have got your two points and you can use your formula y2 minus y1 all over x2 minus x1. So two different ways to do that. The last part of this question is something that we touched on last year and, you know, wondering, did anyone remember it? And we, nobody did. The line K, okay. So the line K passes through the point minus three, two and is perpendicular to the line L. So if the line K passes through the points three and two, it means minus, sorry, minus three and two, it means that they're part of it. We're asked to find the equation of a line. So hopefully you notice, well, the equation of a line is y minus y1 equals m bracket x minus x1, okay? Now, what do these stand for? The y1 and the x1, well, they're fine. I, I know those. But m is the slope. Now, I don't know the slope of this line, k, but I do know that it is perpendicular to l. The slope of l, when we figured it out up here, Hopefully, you got three, okay? If it's perpendicular to this, it means the slope of the first multiplied by the slope of the second must give you minus one. We now know that the slope of L is three. Three multiplied by what would give me minus one? OK, 
okay? And practice, we practiced these last year, you just kind of look and you see it, but actually three multiplied by minus one third, that would actually give you minus one if you multiply those two. So essentially what you're doing, if this was three over one, you turn it upside down and you change the sign. So now I know the slope is minus one third. I know these are the points. So you're going to put all of this into this equation and find me the equation of the line. And you're going to write it in this form where you have the x plus the y plus the number. Okay, I'm just going to do one question of the extra questions, which was very poorly answered, okay? There were two marks going for each of these. And to be honest, sometimes I was given marks when I really shouldn't have been. It wasn't very clear. So a student council is writing a questionnaire. You've been asked to write questions that are based on four different things. And the first question must be numerical discrete. Numerical discrete, it means your answer must be a number and you must be able to count it. The second one here, your answer, so whatever question you ask, it has to be to do with school. So it can be, you know, how long do you study for? How long um, do you spend traveling around the corridors? This would be an, a number. The person would reply with a number, but of course it would be very hard to count it. You would have to measure it, okay? So I want a question there that's numerical continuous. Again, these ones were poorly answered as well. Categorical nominal. A question to do with school life that when I give you the answer, it would be a word I would be telling you and the word would have no order. So a lot of people asked, what is your first class in the morning? So I'm telling you it's French. It doesn't mean that somebody else who's telling you is history. It comes before it. The next one, categorical ordinal. So I'm going to give you a word and it's going to go in an order. So a lot of people asked, what is your favorite class? And so that is going into an order. So that was well done. Or you could answer, you know, what month were you born in? Okay, anything like that. You're given a response as a word. Okay, generally this one was fine. A lot of people wrote things that would be upsetting or wouldn't be relevant to the quest to the person um, or might be too personal. Uh, this one here, to be honest, was poorly answered. You are now going to research for me how you find a simple random sample. Okay, a lot of people said you put all the names into a hat. That's not going to cut it, okay? We want more clear, precise way you can find a simple random sample.